Welcome back to our socially engaged philosophy YouTube channel. Um, nice to see you coming back or maybe coming for the first time. Um, our guest today is David Ludwig, who is professor in the Knowledge, Technology and Innovation Group at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Um, hello, David. Hey. <laughs> um, he is also the principal investigator of a project entitled Global Epistemologies and Ontologies. And I think in more than one way, this um, title of the project is also naturally taken as the heading of what we will be talking about in what, in what follows. Um, David and I got talking about him contributing here in response to a previous um, installments in our channel, namely when we discuss different forms of science criticism. And then David um, helpfully pointed out that there are also some forms of science criticism that we hadn't paid um, that much attention to. So maybe the way to start is for me to invite David to say a little bit more about this fundamental tension, which he sees in our um, current, in our current thinking about, about science and why he thinks that tens tension is important and important for us to pay attention to. Sure, sure. I'm happy to do that. And thanks for having me. And it's a great, great opportunity to continue that conversation because I think you already covered a lot of relevant issues related to science criticism. Um, in the previous session. But at the same time, I do feel that there is a truly fundamental issue that, that often gets overlooked in how philosophers discuss these issues. Um, and I do think of that in terms of attention, or if you want a dilemma. Like on the one hand, there's all this focus on anti-science populism, anti-intellectualism, the Trumps and the Brexits and the way how they relate to issues like climate change and to the COVID pandemic and all of that. And in that perspective, I think often what happens is that science kind of appears as this kind of fragile system that's under threat and that needs to be defended. And there's certainly a lot of truth to that. At the same time, I do feel uh, that that is only one side of a coin that is much more complex. And the other side is that modern science and modern technology are so deeply entangled with the exploitation of people and of the planet that they often very much contribute to the very crisis that they're supposed to address um, and often also contribute to very unequal forms of people benefiting from these crises or having to carry much of the burden of that. And so for me, that is really um, for publicly engaged philosophy of science or publicly engaged thinking about science, a core tension that we need to address. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one thing, one thing that got me thinking um, when, when I listened to you just now is that um, it isn't just um, an issue that is so central to your work, and we will talk about in a moment, between the global south and the global north, right? One might say that we, in fact, have this tension even within the global north, right? Because even in our, uh, in our political social systems, science sometimes has these sorts of um, negative impacts that, that you so rightly emphasize primarily with respect to the global south. Right. I mean, I think, um, of course, um, oppression and people being advantaged or disadvantaged by the results of science happens in all geographic contexts. It happens along different dimensions, such as um, race, but also class or gender that are, of course, very much relevant also in the global north. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what, what is important is is to understand, first of all, that there is a tension because often that I think that gets overlooked mm. and that becomes especially salient when you think of that through the perspective of the global science. So, so one thing that I often do with my students to kind of bring that out is that I uh, present them this famous quote um, by the black feminist writer, Audre Lorde. Um, many of you will have heard of it. Um, that the master's tools can never dismantle the master's house. Mm. 
And then I asked them to take five minutes and to think about how they would relate that quote to modern science. Mm -hmm. And if you're watching this on YouTube, then you could also stop the video and do that exercise, right? Think for five minutes, how would you relate science to that quote? And what I kind of learned from my students is that there tend to be very different responses to that. Some of them very much mobilize a quote in challenging modern science, right? And science becomes part of the master's tools. And my students are usually not philosophy students, but development students. So they have a lot of good examples about how modern industrial agriculture destroys local environments and livelihoods, or how conservation biology um, threatens indigenous communities and kicks people out of protected areas, or, or how modern pharmaceutical research and, and global health research further contributes um, um, health inequalities on a global scale. Um, but then on the other hand, there are also students who mobilize science against the quote and say, well, that's too simple, right? Because obviously we can't just reject modern science and then we return back to these examples of climate change or of the COVID pandemic, where I don't think anyone would want to uh, suggest that we should not uh, take the best evidence and the best research that we have in addressing those issues. So um, I think both of these perspectives convey important insights about the role of science in contemporary societies. And one of our challenges, I think, as, as philosophers and especially as philosophers of science is to think through these tensions and contradictions. Yeah, no, I mean, I find this, I find this, if I may say, say so, liberating in more than what sense, in more than one sense, um, what you say, because also often um, in the global north, when one um, um, even gives a sociological political analysis of science, one is quickly put in the box of being um, um, against science as a liberator. Mm. Um, and recognizing that there is a legitimate critical way of looking at science, all the way up to the point where one sees science as part of a tool of oppression, I think is an, is an important lesson for us um, to recognize pretty much in all of our dealing and, and, and reflection on science, whether we deal with, with, um, uh, with the global north or with, or with the global south. I mean, I have, an, I have a follow on question on, on this is that um, um, on a very naive view, of course, one would think, well, science as a tool of liberation, that's the, that's the view of the global north, um, science as a tool of um, oppression um, is the view of the global south, but of course, also in the global south, we have both perspectives on science, right? So can you say yeah. a little bit about the, about how this tension plays itself out in like the, the political discourse and in the, even in the philosophical discourse of um, thinkers in the, in the global south? Right. So, so first of all, you're absolutely right that, that it's not as simple as, as kind of defending science as a global north issues and criticizing science as a global south issue. And a lot of the concerns about like anti-science, anti-intellectualism, you can make that point with Bolsonaro as much as you can make it with Trump, right? Mm -hmm. um, so of course the dynamic is much more complicated. Um, but what I feel we can learn by listening more to intellectuals from the global south mm -hmm. is how these tensions actually um, play into our scientific practices on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Because one thing that I'm really concerned about in our, if you want, like Western discourse about science, and that includes philosophers, that includes mm -hmm. also sociologists of science and, mm -hmm. and historians of science, is that, that it seems that we're so focused on, on one side of the problem that we don't, often don't even recognize the other side, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so looking at Global South intellectuals really helps with that. So for example, in Latin America, uh, you could look at people like Arturo Escobar, who has been famous for criticizing the idea of development and has very much uh, connected that to, to the idea that modern science is not an emancipatory force in the Global South mm -hmm. anymore. 
in the Indian context, you could connect it to like eco-feminist like Vandana Shiva, who's mm -hmm. been um, who's been criticizing modern modern agriculture, um, modern genetic modification, and that and often has been perceived by global North scholars and as kind of an anti-science activist, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or if you look at, at the African context, you could look at, at movements like, like Roads Must Fall in South Africa that have been challenging the, co like the, the apartheid um, legacies of the South African university system. And again, often have been seen uh, by, by the scientific establishment as kind of propagating some kind of anti-science attitude. Um, and so, so indeed, the, the idea, of course, cannot only be to criticize science for how it contributes to oppression. Mm -hmm. But I think having a, a meaningful conversation about these issues, first of all, requires to understand that dynamic. And I think often in, in terms of the intellectual discourse that we're having about science in the global north, we're failing to understand the very dynamic and are being blind towards it. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, no, I think, I think that is, that is, that strikes me as, as absolutely right. Just out of just out of curiosity, is there a global south? I mean, I guess I guess one thing that is in, particularly important to thinkers in the global north these days is, of course, the position of climate science. And um, it seems that as soon as climate science is being criticized, um, one is putting oneself in a very problematic um, boat. And so I'm, so, so I'm curious, is there a, um, a global South form of um, philosophically informed criticism of aspects of, of climate science that would um, put a critical focus on, on some as, aspects or sides of a, of a climate science? Yeah, there is. Um, although I would, I would say there, there are two parts of the response. So, so one of the issues that I think generates this kind of disconnect in, in debates where, where, where people seem to have radically different perspectives on, on the social function of science uh, depends very much on kind of what disciplines you look at. Right, mm -hmm. so I sometimes call that this a problem of reference science. Yes. Right, so 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 the um, the idea that science must be defended because it's under threat most clearly becomes articulated when you look at climate science, when you look at let's say um, like contemporary debates about COVID and all of that. Mm -hmm. you know? um, issues of science as contributing to the oppression of people or the destruction of environments, of course, becomes more clear if you look at other areas of science, right? Like, for example, agricultural sciences. Mm -hmm. The philosophers of science are very good in thinking about some sciences, including recently climate science. Mm -hmm. There is not a lot of philosophy of agricultural sciences, for example. Mm -hmm. right? So that's already part of the problem, I think, that we're so focused on certain sciences rather than others. Um, but then even if you look at climate science, there are, of course, um, a lot of different dimensions to understanding climate systems and how they interact with the livelihoods of people. Right? Mm -hmm. And um, so there's, there's, there's a huge body of literature, for example, on, on indigenous perspectives, on climate mm -hmm. change, um, mm -hmm. both because indigenous people are often the first people who detect changes in the in their ecosystems right mm -hmm. they're often the ones who are most directly affected mm -hmm. at least at this stage where like urbanized westerners may may live through some of these things without noticing them so much mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of uh, reason also already to incorporate local knowledge but mm -hmm. then of course also local needs and perspectives onto those issues mm -hmm. yeah um, um I want to come back to this problem of the reference science, which seems to be mm -hmm. one, one of the um, one of the things that everyone who does philosophy of science, I think, should take away from your course. Um, and we're thinking especially of of more junior people who are who are interested in philosophy of science but haven't yet quite chosen their science to work on. And if one just simply looks at the list of of sciences that that you mention in various of your publications or talks that don't get a hearing, um, but are of crucial significance to the sort of social political issues that you are 
that you are flagging. I think that's that's something I do not want to be lost in the in all the other things that we will be um, <laughs> will be will be talking about. So let's so let's come back to the to the um, to the question how to as you sometimes put it decolonialize philosophy of science. Let's yeah. let's, let's let's keep that let's hold that topic for a moment. I rather want to give you an occasion to say a bit about the. Um, political question, the questions of a political science that um, the, uh, the, the issues of the, of the Global South and the kind of science reflection that the Global South thinkers lead us to. What, what kind of political philosophy of science do we need um, yeah. to better get a handle on, on these phenomena? Yeah, that, that's of course an incredibly tricky question, right? Um, because so far we've only talked, I think, about recognizing a problem, right? And it's often much more easy, it's much easier to kind of uh, diagnose a problem than to figure out how to address it. Um, but so, so I think part of the diagnosis then is that a lot of the critical perspectives on science, especially the ones that emerge out of social movements that emerge in the global south are not really anti-science, at least in the way people are worried about, right? There may be anti-science in a similar way as critique of globalization is anti-globalization, right? Mm -hmm. um, anti-globalization movements are not against the idea of people kind of connecting around the world or whatever, mm -hmm. They're rather challenging a specific system of how uh, globalization is economically structured, right? Mm -hmm. And so the idea then, then, as those movements often put it, right, is that another world is possible. Mm -hmm. I think something very similar appears in this dynamic of, of thinking about tensions in, in science and society, that there is indeed a critique of science as it currently exists, right? And in that sense, we could describe it as anti-science, um, but it very much comes with, the, I think, with uh, the idea that another science is possible, right? And I would, I would imagine or I would hope that we as, as philosophers who think about science and other intellectuals who engage with science contribute to that conversation of reimagining how science functions in society and how it relates to broader political structures. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, of course, leads then to, to your question of, of what exactly would that kind of political philosophy of science look like, right? And I, and, and I think my first answer would, that would be that we really need to broaden our understanding of political philosophy of science or of socially engaged philosophy of science that I think currently is often very narrowly focused on issues of science and values, whatever values like an individual scientist may have when like, like trying to confirm a hypothesis or something like that. Mm -hmm. And we need to move from values to, to questions of justice, right? We need to think about, I mean, we can also think about values. That's also an important topic, but I think we need, also need a very much a debate about science and justice. And that of course requires some more interactions with political philosophy as well. Mm -hmm. Can I can I just try out um, and, and get get your view on one one form this might take? You said mm -hmm. we need a we need a political philosophy of science oriented toward questions of justice. The moment you said that, I couldn't help remembering two names: one from political philosophy and one from philosophy of science, namely John Rawls and Philip Kitcher. Mm -hmm. um, John Rawls, of course, just to say two words for our listeners, has this abstract decision procedure on how to pick a to pick the principles for a just society and we do this like by imagining people making this decision be, behind a veil of ignorance where they don't know their own position in a society and then from that not knowing one's own position in society one then thinks well what principles would i want that society to be governed by philip kitcher then comes along and says great idea john rawls um, we should use that also as a central tool for doing political philosophy of science. We should imagine that there is a community um, of decision makers representing all of humanity. And then in that abstract um, reflection decides on what kind of principles do we want our science policy to be governed by. So let's take that as a as one, as one model of what a political philosophy of science oriented to what justice might look like. What would you say from your 
um, perspective from, from, from the direction in which you come to this problem, what right. would you say about such a model? I mean, I, um, I see the, the, the value in, 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 in some of that. And um, I also have learned a lot from, from reading and engaging with scripture. Um, at the same time, I do struggle often in connecting these very abstract frameworks towards concrete manifestations of injustice as they're produced in engagement with science and technology. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think my own um, methodological approach, and we'll get to that maybe later, has been, has been quite different in the sense that I've been working with empirical researchers, with local communities, trying to understand the concrete manifestations of injustices or justices that are being produced. And having this abstract ideal of, an, of, a, of a society in which all humanity is represented and all issues of racism and sexism and classism have, have been resolved, um, I don't think it gets us that far in terms, of, uh, in terms of addressing those issues. So in that sense, I do feel there's often more value in, in looking, for example, at social activists and the way how they're engaging with science and technology, the kind of justices or injustices that they detect, rather than, than coming from it from this very abstract ideal theory of like a just society. Okay, yes, no, I think I think I, I can very much sympathize with that with that answer um, um, myself. Um, of course, there would be lots more to say about the politics um, of, of science from the perspectives that that David brings brings forward. but I want I want to move the direction a little bit um, and more towards the epistemological mm -hmm. um, questions. And the intriguing thing, of course, is that in your project title, you speak of global epistemologies and um, ontologies in the plural. And I can imagine some colleagues in uh, philosophy and maybe also beyond philosophy um, um, who, whose uh, pulse rate increases when they see the, the, the plural forms of, um, of epistemology and, and ontology. Can you say a little bit about what motivates the, 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 the plurals here and and um, what you would say to those who would, who would be nervous about it? Right, so, so I think if we move from the more straightforward political questions of like say who economically benefits from, from a certain research project and who's, who's disadvantaged by certain technological innovations or whatever to, to epistemological and ontological questions. And the first part is to see how they're related with each other, right? And, um, and so, the relation as I see it is that, that science and philosophy have very deeply rooted tendencies of paternalism, right? So when they engage with, with for example, with communities in the global south, that, that it, it's the scientists who are the true experts, right? And then, then afterwards, it's the philosophers who sit in their armchairs and kind of judge which kind of opinions were correct or whatever. Um, and so, so part of that, I think, is what, what actually creates a lot of these like more object level injustices, right? That we have like, like, like forms that are unjust in how we organize knowledge, whose knowledge is being recognized, whose frameworks are being used. Um, and so I'm very much um, pushing towards talking about plural epistemologies and ontologies and sciences and knowledge systems in a way as a strategic tool, if you want, of moving beyond that idea and recognizing that, for example, epistemological reflection, right? Like thinking about like how knowledge is produced, when knowledge is being ve valid and so on. It's not something that only like, like people in, in Europe and philosophy departments do, right? But these are questions that, that everyone is concerned with in one way or another. And in that sense, I think, if we want to create more just forms of science, we need to create more space for that type of epistemic and ontological diversity as well. Now, one, one, um, one off the cuff um, reply that I imagine some of my conservative colleagues in, in epistemology making at this point would be to, to turn the question back to you and ask you, 
Well, would you think that an oracle use, like the Azandi famously use, um, would you consider that an that an epistemic practice? Would you say that there is an that there is an epistemology of an oracle use? I mean, I don't. I'm not that worried about that. Why not? <laughs> um, um, I mean, of course, it's not that that people can't be wrong, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or it's not that you can't criticize the way how people, for example, try to predict things. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of cultural practices, including like Oracle uses are, are very complex, right? And so, mm -hmm. so they have different epistemic and non-epistemic functions. And, and some of them we may criticize, other, others may, may make sense to us. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'm not that concerned about it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so you would you would want to say something like um, any system by means of which members of a certain culture or practice reach beliefs which they give a special status as likely to be true. Any such practice would count as an epistemology, which is not to say that you necessarily agree on the on the good making qualities of that practice, but you simply would recognize this is a this is a technique and a practice with a certain goal. And since the goal recognizably is something like we want to have reliable beliefs or true beliefs, since that's the goal of the practice, let's call that practice an epistemological practice. Is that roughly the roughly the view? Yeah. So so. Yeah. Um... I mean, I, mean I, I sympathize. I sympathize with the viewer. I just, I just want to make sure that. Right. So, that, so, that, so that I think what, what, you, what, what you may think. be helpful is to kind of shift from, if you want, like the, the abstract example of an of an of an oracle, whatever mm -hmm. it may be defined, mm -hmm. into like concrete cases, right? Yeah. Where, where, like, for example, I work with um, like local communities or indigenous communities who often have like very sp spiritual beliefs mm -hmm. and are very much experts about the ecosystems, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of those spiritual beliefs are very much entangled with the practices of how they engage with the forests or whatever ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of their expertise is also entangled with that. Right? So, so for example, a lot of the spiritual taboos contribute to, to, the, to the forest not being overhunted or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think we, as we, we may look at this and try then to disentangle the parts that, that we consider justified, the others that, that we consider non-justified. And to some degree, we can do that, right? Like as we can do that with every knowledge, including like, like Western knowledge, knowledge of our own communities. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that the situation is that different there, right? So there are some things that we'll agree on, some things that we won't agree on. And then there will be a lot of things that we don't really understand that way, right? So I think what often happens when people talk about spiritual practices is that they don't, don't really understand what, for example, an indigenous community means when, when they have a taboo. And then they kind of interpret that in like the least charitable way in which it turns out to be false. Um, so, so I don't really uh, am that worried about there being a lot of epistemic content in there. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's also often a lot of um, sophisticated reflection about knowledge producing practices. So it's not only first level knowledge, it's also people reflecting about it. So I don't mind at all calling that an epistemology. I mean, I'm also not like the language police. If someone else wants to define epistemology in a more narrow sense, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for, for my own purposes, um, it usually makes much more sense to use that term in a broader sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can I just um, try to capture what you just said in a slightly sure. different language? Um, so when I asked you about the role of the, of the spiritual beliefs that um, um, might look on the face of it more more problematic to us from a from the Western or Western philosophical scientific perspective. Um, you would say, well, you have to you have to allow for some holism here, and the spiritual beliefs and the empirical beliefs are, are interwoven, and therefore um, you know you no longer talk about their epistemic practice when you start teasing apart those bits that are truly epistemic. And then try to throw out the others. Um, it's the it's the holism that kind of 
blocks the separation. The reason why I'm why I'm uh, why I'm why I'm suggesting formulating the view is that it seems to me quite similar to the kind of response Wittgenstein had to when he um, commented on um, anthropological work in the 19. 30s and 40s and also it seems to me the sort of position that also some authors in the sociology of scientific knowledge would be um, inclined to take this emphasis on the on the holism and the difficulty of like neatly separating out what is truly epistemic and what is really something something else altogether yeah yeah, yeah, I would be happy with that. Um, I think another another dimension that I tend to add is sort of the link between epistemology and ontology, right? So it's one thing to to recognize a local community, for example, about as experts about an ecosystem, and to say it's not only the scientists who know a lot about about that, but also like other people. And then there's the other part of, of how that links to different worldviews, right? And that's where you kind of get into all these kind of you want metaphysical troubles of spirits and oracles and taboos and all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so um, then part of the question then is not only how do we think about different forms of producing knowledge, right? But also how do we think about different worldviews, different ways of kind of thinking about how the universe works. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so I think there we also often have this implicit tendency to, to, to think that only the scientific way of carving up the world is the correct one, right? And if, if things kind of like radically depart from that, there must be just kind of um, folk beliefs that have been falsified by science or something. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is once you start engaging in engaging with it in more detail is so much more complex. Mm -hmm. So, so for example, some of the the issues that that don't seem to make sense to a lot of scientists, like let's say, like a forest thinking, right, mm -hmm. and that being being part of like the ontology of an indigenous community, is actually not that implausible, right? So, so a lot of scientists have actually come to to be concerned with, with questions of plant intelligence and all of that. Mm -hmm. The way how we carve up what counts as thinking or who counts as a person is far from straightforward. And recognizing that there are very different ontological options of doing that, I think is something that, that, that matters a lot in recognizing that, that we can engage with the world around us in incredibly different ways. And, and then tying that back to, to the type of knowledge diversity that we need to produce also a more just form of, of science or knowledge production. Mm -hmm. There's a sentence um, that I sometimes read in, in the work of, of David Bluer, which took me a long time to get my head around. But I only kind of began to understand it better when I started relating it to the sort of concerns that people like you and anthropologists um, bring to the fore about, about um, cultures, um, in different circumstances, at different levels of development, in our senses, and this is a, this this is sentence um, that all cultures are equally close to nature. I mean, even if one thinks of like a tribe somewhere in the Amazon, on like a naive scientific view, we would say, "Well, look, um, our science is much closer to nature because we can break up the, um, you know, we can break up the electrons, and that means that we are deeper into nature." But in some sense, that's not quite true, because if one thinks about the proximity to nature as to how closely one engages with it and how closely does one find observable um, regularities that one needs in order to survive, if one thinks about proximity to nature in terms of those sorts of attention to regularities in one's environment, then it makes eminent sense to say that um, well, in some sense, all cultures are equally close to nature. And then, of course, we have our abstract high-level theorizing that we have in our science. But of course, in other cultures, they also have their high-level theorizing that looks quite different from our high-level theorizing. But it also, in some respects, tries to make further sense of the observable regularities. Does that... Yeah, yeah. I mean, that sounds quite plausible to me. I mean, I, I would maybe um, 
try to avoid the, the, the idea that there is like one measure of proximity yeah. to nature, sure. right? Yeah, so, yeah, sure. so I'm yeah. not sure whether I would say everyone is equally close to nature because I wouldn't be sure what that means. Uh -huh. um, but I think the spirit of that is something that I, that I very much endorse in, in the sense that, that indeed being close to nature um, can mean different things for different purposes. And of course, modern science is very close to nature for the purposes of, let's say, technological control that, that modern technology uh, aims for, right? And, and one thing that you learn when, when engaging um, with local expertise, for example, of indigenous communities is that, that these communities are very close to nature for the kind of concerns that matter for the community. Right? whether it's their daily yeah. livelihood practices like hunting, agriculture, whether it's uh, the way how they're culturally, emotionally, spiritually relate to the world yeah. around them. Yeah. So, so, so given, given these concerns, of course, there is much more close, closeness in these communities. And given other concerns that, that dominate modern science, of course, modern science is very close to nature. Right? Yeah, yeah. I guess also David Bluer didn't want to be taken as saying there is one measure of, of a proximity. I guess, I guess in a way he was trying to, to, um, to lead to absurdity, the view that we yeah. are necessarily and inevitably closer to nature simply because we can, we can smash electrons against each other. Yeah, uh, fair enough, uh, fair enough. <laughs> That was the one. Okay, great. Um, um, maybe we can shift a little bit towards the more general level of, um, of um, well, in two ways. Um, on, in more general ways to ask what does it mean to decolonialize our knowledge? And you have this nice three-partite distinction there that I want, to, want you to have a chance to, to, to talk a bit about. And then finally, we should turn the question more directly towards philosophy and ask what would it mean to decolonialize philosophical knowledge and philosophical practices. But maybe you could talk first first a bit about your three-partite distinction and because it nicely brings out um, right. the important focus. So, um, so there's three concepts are paternalism, diversity, and decolonization. Um, and so, so the reason why, why I'm using those three concepts is that the first one of paternalism is, is something that I think very much has dominated the way how scientists have engaged with issues in the global south. And in many ways, it still dominates it, right? So, so, so the idea then is that the scientists are the true experts. Um, they produce the knowledge to create um, to create better livelihoods for people, to increase the productivity of seeds or whatever. And so they're going with their science and their technology into the global south, and then they, they kind of like help people, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's kind of like, if you want the traditional paternalistic way of thinking about development and also thinking about the role of science in development, right? Mm -hmm. We're exporting our, all of our beautiful science and technology. Um, and so, so part of, I think, the ongoing going issue of, of trying to think of more just forms of knowledge production is to overcome that type of paternalism. And that's what we're talking about, all these very abstract and kind of obscure issues of, of different epistemologies and ontologies of kind of coming, coming to terms with the, with the idea that there are very different forms of expertise, different ways of producing knowledge that matter for different people. Um, and so scientists just kind of exporting their, their beautiful technologies from, from the Netherlands where I am or from Austria where you are into, into the global south is often not actually going to improve people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then that's where you kind of end up with diversity, right? So the idea that there are many different knowledge systems that, that need to be recognized. Um, and that kind of have something valuable to contribute. For example, when thinking about climate change, as I said earlier, like a lot of indigenous communities have a lot of knowledge about, about changing ecosystem dynamics and all of that. Um, and, and to some degree, of course, that is a position that has become more and more mainstream, at least in kind of intellectual circles of social scientists, philosophers, humanities people, where, where it's all, of course, about diversity talk, right? Mm -hmm. And um, um, at the same time, one issue that has kind of 
become my concern in, in engaging with these issues more in practice is that a lot of that incorporation is often very superficial. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of also um, indigenous scholars, a lot of activists are very concerned about the way how scientists kind of access their knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and so commonly the, the, the concerns are things like, like what sometimes is called like knowledge mining, right? Or like the, the assimilation of knowledge where scientists kind of take bits and pieces of other worldviews of other perspectives mm -hmm. that are useful for their purposes, right? So, so, so the, the questions are already defined, the methods, the frameworks, and then, then the scientists kind of look, well, what do other people have contribute to, to that? Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. um, and so, so just talking about diversity then, is often not enough. And that's why often talk about decolonization uh, comes into play in these, in these debates of trying to move beyond that, not just kind of giving people like one seat at the table of having, having to add their data to it, mm -hmm. but rather of really negotiating the way, what kind of questions we're asking, what kind of methods we're using, what kind of frameworks we rely on, what kind of epistemic, but also political goals we have when we do science. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's a much more fundamental issue uh, that is of course much more difficult to address in the current science system. But that's where like the challenge of decolonization comes from that is much more than, than if you want superficial diversity talk. Mm -hmm. So um, um, I have a question about, about the, the decolonialization. Um, strategy. Um, I, I, can, I can see how that works in the case of the, um, broadly speaking, um, you call it um, the reference sciences here are the action sciences, right? What was the word? Um, applied action. No. Yeah, yeah. Like, like yeah. The, the kind of, uh, well, we can call them action research or whatever. Action, action, yeah, action, sorry. Yeah, I, action, action research. So, so there I can see how the decolonialization strategy works. I'm, I'm curious whether there would also be a decolonialization strategy for the sciences that are not in the realm of, um, of action research. So for you, you say we should, we should get the focus of the reference sciences away from physics and mathematics and, and evolutionary biology, and let's rather focus on those, let's, let's, let's also get into view <coughs> different set of reference sciences. Okay, now good. Um, now in the case of those um, action research fields, um, we come up with this intriguing and provocative and, and uh, challenging and um, fascinating new strategy of, of dealing with our own knowledge. I'm now curious about um, what we have learned there um, is there something that we can take from there back into those more uh, traditional um, reference sciences for the for the philosophy of yeah. science? I, I do think so. Um, I think there there are two aspects to that. One of it is that, of course, now in in, in our conversation, I very much um, emphasize the political dimension of doing science. Mm -hmm. I do not want to deny that science also has a lot of epistemic dimensions that are not straightforwardly politicized. Mm -hmm. right? um, and so you can always think of examples of, of, if you want, like the purest of the pure basic science, mm -hmm. where it's very unclear what the political dimension is, or you can think of like the most politicized uh, um, industry funded GMO research where, where like the epistemic dimension kind of gets lost in the politics. But much of it is, I think, on a spectrum in between, right? And, mm -hmm. and so sometimes we're more interested, especially as philosophers of science on, on the epistemic side on things. And sometimes I think we need to pay more attention to the political side. So I don't want to deny that. I don't want to say like everything is politics and everything needs to be politicized. And if you don't politicize your quantum physics project, you're, you're doing kind of colonial work or something like that. Mm -hmm. right? So that's not the idea. Um, at the same time, um, I do think that even in the areas that, that we consider basic science, uh, and that we kind of often frame as something very much depoliticized, uh, a lot of these issues do come up and they're often more masked. 
Um, so, so, so one area that I've been engaging with quite a bit are questions of, um, of for example, biological taxonomy, right? Which seems like a very dry, fundamental, uh, like, like research activity of people identifying like the basing building blocks of the biological world or something like that, right? But taxonomy is very complicated, right? The kind of like, like ways, for example, how we distinguish between species that interacts, for example, with, with issues of conservation, right? Like how, like what's, what's considered a species has, has a lot of political implications on how then our con conservation practices are structured. Um, and so that's something I think that scientists are starting to come to terms with, that, that even in these kind of like more basic research issues, um, a lot of these uh, normative dimensions reappear. What people are still often more blind to is like the wider political dimension and how it interacts with questions of justice, right? So I think, for example, biological taxonomists are increasingly recognized that, that there may be a conservation dimension to taxonomy. Um, it's it's much less uh, a focus right now to understand how like different ways of doing taxonomy interacts with the livelihoods of local communities in the global south, and that's actually, for example, research project that I'm working on right now with uh, with an anthropologist from Indonesia who's who's looking at like the effects on local communities of the discovery that's kind of controversial of a new orangutan species, right? So so those kind of cases where where you would think that say that it's just an epistemic issue, mm -hmm. but it turns out to be also a political issue. Yeah. But then the claim is of course not that it's only a political issue. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, and of course one could one could one could add to that a more a more traditional concern of some parts of the of the left, um, especially in, in the US and in the UK, where it was about demilitarizing fundamental physics. I mean, after all, as the late Ian Hacking once told me that there was a time when more than 80% of American physicists engaged in fundamental physics had some level of, of uh, security clearing because their work was judged as directly or indirectly relevant to the, yeah. to the, to, to the military, I guess, Something as blatantly obvious as that also also shows how important it is. And of course, um, demilitarization has something to do with de decolonialization. So I guess the the links the links there are also are also obvious. Um, yeah, I'm also reminded of the fact that when they were um, identifying the um, the DNA um, of of different organisms, there was some debate over which country would get, would get which organism. And of course, the Western countries secured for themselves all the most interesting and the most complex yeah. organisms, leaving leaving for the poorer um, countries the somewhat scientifically less interesting organisms. So, so once one starts digging, of course, one finds many many different yeah. Um, yeah. facets to that. Um, right. Okay. So thank you for that helpful um, taxonomy of these different forms of uh, of decolonializing science, let's finally come home, as it were, and ask what would it mean to uh, decolonialize philosophy? Of course, we already started talking about this, the idea that talk about epistemologies and ontologies in the, in the plural, um, but what other dimensions do you see for what we can do to, to, to critically address our philosophical knowledge and not just philosophy of science. And yeah. maybe, maybe we can say something about philosophy. Yeah, no, I, I very much agree. That's an, an issue for philosophy, for philosophy in general and for philosophical methodology. And I think it's something where I'm also, I'm still trying to figure out a lot of things because, mm -hmm. because in the end, I think I, I've like thought more carefully about the science part than the philosophy part. Um, but, but, I do think that the, the three dimensions of paternalism and, um, and diversity and decoloniality also matter for, for philosophy. And so the paternalist move in philosophy would be to use whatever kind of framework you have, whether you're like Kantian or, or Heideggerian or Foucauldian or whatever, or Wittgensteinianian, uh, and just kind of apply that, for example, to issues in the global South. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
I don't want to be like unfair to, to Philip, but, but let, let's say, you know, what you had earlier as the example of mm -hmm. using Wald's framework of thinking about what just science looks like, and then using that framework to, um, to think about issues in the global south would be an example of that. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that's not only bad, right? A lot of like also export of science and technology in the global south had, had also positive effects. Um, but at the same time, it is very limited, right? And so, so I think a lot of the, the diversity talk in philosophy, of course, aims to address also the kind of the paternalistic and colonial legacy there of, of philosophy. Um, but, then, but then I think some of it can also end up being rather superficial, just as in science. And I think one area where I feel it can be rather superficial is that you have, for example, you're teaching a course on ethics or in philosophy of mind or introduction to epistemology or whatever, you already have kind of carved out the main problems, right? The problem of skepticism, the problem of realism and so on. And then you're just kind of looking for some authors in, let's say, from, from, from ancient Chinese or, or Indian philosophy or whatever to kind of address the kind of questions that you already had. Yeah. So that would be, I think, very much like the analogy to, to what scientists do when they kind of incorporate local data from, 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 from in, let's say, indigenous communities into ecological models or something like that. And again, that can be valuable, but it's, it's often very limited, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so I think the decolonial move would be then to, to ask more, uh, more substantially what kind of questions are we asking as philosophers? This was what kind of methods are we then approaching, them, right? And, and so, so in a way then I would say that also our starting point when I, when I said we're kind of often asking the wrong questions as socially engaged philosophers of science would be, would be motivated by that, right? By saying, well, it's not just like listening to people in the global south to, towards our questions about climate change or COVID, but it's actually taking that research more seriously and asking how can it transform the kind of questions that we are asking as philosophers of science. Mm -hmm. So, so would that um, would that involve one in actually philosophizing together with thinkers from the global south, mm -hmm. or would it mean like um, reflecting philosophically on, say, um, you know, what what is the what is the philosophical status of something like um, action research um, of the kinds of reference science that that you are interested in? Um, how, I mean, in, in, an, in an ideal world, um, um, how would we, to put it quite, quite uh, gigantically, um, how would we transform philosophy education um, in, the, in the global north? Um, if we really took seriously your um, insistence on that it is important, and I share, of course, the sentiment that it's important to decolonialize our philosophical knowledge. Right. Um, so, so I think in, in terms of education, of course, uh, the, the kind of the syllabus, the kind of things that you read are often the starting point, and I think that, that that's fair enough. Um, and then what I said earlier, the, the idea would then be not just to kind of already define your questions and then, then find the authors for it, mm -hmm. but also to, to allow to be challenged in what kind of questions you do address in your introduction to epistemology, ethics, mm -hmm. philosophy of mind or whatever you're doing. Um, but then, of course, the, the other part that you mentioned is, is not just a question, but also the method then of how to discuss it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, that becomes much more tricky um, because in the end, I do think that, that it is true that, that we need to do things much more collaboratively as philosophers and engaging with these issues. Um, and that requires often like a very fundamental transformation of our of our ways of kind of producing scholarly work. And mm -hmm. I think for me, that's been, been quite a long road of learning as someone mm -hmm. who's been, been trained as a, if you want, like a standard analytic philosopher of science, mm -hmm. um, doing, my, doing my own um, like research by myself, writing my papers by myself, 
um, from like a library in Europe or North America towards what I'm doing now, where I'm working in a very large team of, of people who have different disciplinary backgrounds, where I'm trying to do field work myself. And of mm -hmm. course, that's a very long road as someone as a philosopher to kind of kind of get comfortable with all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't necessarily think that that's like the only way, right? So, so, so I mean, for example, like there are other ways of engaging with different standpoints. Um, for example, as a like like working more historically, right, mm -hmm. uh, where you can also be challenged in your mm -hmm. ways of thinking and your methods of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I don't think that's necessarily the only way. But then there's still, of course, if you do it more historically, the question: How are you doing? history right mm, so just yeah. kind of if you want like data mining of historical sources to kind of come up with nice new arguments in the current debate right or is it actually using those sources and challenging like your established way of thinking about so mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i mean um I, I was asking about about this um of this collaborative character because one of the frustrating things i noticed a few years ago i think it was like four years ago at a conference in, in Austria, in the mountains, um, for the first time in my whole life, and I'm now 61, um, for the first time in my whole life, I saw a philosopher from Black Africa. For the first time in my life, I'd never seen oh, wow. from, from any of those countries um, at any of the conferences that I ever ever attended. Well, it, it might tell you something about my own philosophical interest, maybe that that is that that is the case. Yeah. But it's still striking that I mean, I get sometimes emails or letters from people in those in those countries, is that the global North philosophical community and the global South philosophical community almost never meet. I mean, you meet them, you meet them sometimes in the sense that um, there is, for example, in Sao Paulo, a group that's very interested in 19th century philosophy. So they bring me in to talk to them about 19th century philosophy in Germany. Um, but all of the global South um, problematic is completely blocked out in the whole in the whole meeting. And I really wish that um, I wish that as one of one of the things that um, that arise from work like 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 uh, yours that also philosophers like me who are not directly working on the sort of references science that you work on mm -hmm. that we also were challenged more in our own work um, through the encounter with um, philosophers from the global south so I wish there were more more channels and more ways of like financing and making possible those sorts of um, um, exchanges because yeah. I have the impression that right now that's actually it's not that easy to actually identify. Yeah, of, course, of course not because I think contemporary academic philosophy is incredibly exclusive and mm -hmm. restrictive and mm -hmm. and that very much relates to to what I said in terms of like the diversity versus the coloniality distinction. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sure, if you have a have a person of color or a scholar from from the global south um, writing exactly the same way yeah. you're writing, <laughs> addressing yeah. the same kind of question with the same kind of methods, right? Right. Everyone is happy about diversity, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. but the reason why we're not having more diversity in philosophy is because um, if if you al already have to go through all of those gates and have to leave like all your own intellectual traditions mm -hmm. behind for that. Mm -hmm. And then of course it's only going to be like a very small community of people who who who's willing and has the resources to do that. Yeah. So in order to to actually have a more inclusive debate in philosophy, we need to make that additional step, right? Yeah. Of asking what kind of questions are we uh, addressing as philosophers? Is what kind of methods, right? And then mm -hmm. then indeed like the. the if you do that, then you start engaging with different authors, you start inviting different people, you start going to different conferences and all of that. Mm -hmm. I think that that's something that very much has happened to me, where, where I think your, your experience that you mentioned, it could have been also me like, like 10 years ago when I started as a philosopher, where, where I went also to mostly like, you know, the mainstream society confer conferences that are not very diverse. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then as my interests evolve, I'm reading other people and inviting other people and being invited by other people. I'm starting to go to different events. Mm -hmm. so, so that then leads to, to engaging with different communities. But I think the, 
the kind of the sad truth is that for me that also partly leads out of the academic philosophy community, right? Because in order to become engaged with more diverse forms of, of thinking about science and technology to kind of employ more diverse methods, you kind of have to leave at least what the mainstream of academic philosophy is, at least yeah. for now. And I think that will only change if we're changing the way how our discipline functions. Yeah, I think the thing that makes me um, slightly optimistic <laughs> In that, in that respect, is the uh, is a phenomenon like the recent um, upsurge in interest in in the field called political epistemology, because of course much of the work you do, broadly speaking, is political epistemology of science, right? And you bring the epistemological and the and the political um, um, together. I guess in the global north, the political epistemology question is. Um, at present focused on more individualistic phenomena by some authors, even though some other authors also see much more the, uh, much more the collective side and people like Hasslanger have made categories like race and of course Apia and many others have made the category of, of, of race an issue that's also important in, um, in a political epistemology. And I think um, your work brings home to us that there is a still further big issue that political epistemology is only now beginning to explore. And that is the political epistemology um, um, related to work on connections between the global North and the global South in their, in their philosophical thinking and, uh, and the theorizing. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I would agree. Of course, uh, there are reasons to be optimistic. A lot has changed, I think, in academic philosophy over the past decade or so, at mm -hmm. least for me, like I think mm -hmm. when I started, like as a philosophy student, uh, the field looked quite different than it looks now. Um, and I very much agree that, that, that fields like political and social epistemology, um, social ontology, philosophy of race, they're all kind of reflections of, of shifts within the field. Um, and at the same time, I do also feel that the current state of these debates often reflects that we still have a very long way to go. So, so, so I actually like started a lot of this kind of journey more in these debates about philosophy of race. And I do think there's obviously a lot of uh, value in, in critically thinking about um, categories of race. Mm -hmm. But my sense is that, that and especially analytically trained philosophers tend to think about these issues in a, in a quite narrow way that's often informed by, by um, conceptual analysis of the English language, right? Mm -hmm. The word race works in English. Mm -hmm. And it may be valuable for understanding how like the social ontology of race in the US it often tells us very little about the realities in the global south. It tells us very little about the majority of racialized people around the world, and especially those who face the most extreme forms of racial oppression. So, so I feel in, in many ways there has been a lot of progress. Um, and at the same time, I feel a lot of these debates are very much need to, to, to engage about these topics from a more like globally um, focused perspective. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great final sentence. Um, I think I'm I'm wholeheartedly with you. Um, it was great to have you, and glad thank to thank you so much for having me. You great. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you found it interesting. You found it stimulating, and I hope you will be back for our next session. Thank you very much. <laughs>